This is Open to Hope Radio, featuring Dr. Gloria Horsley and her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley, coming to you on behalf of the Open to Hope Foundation, dedicated to those who are looking for hope after loss. Now, here's Dr. Gloria. Welcome to Grief Relief. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we've had a lot going on with this Malaysian uh, airplane crash, 370, which uh, as of today they still have not found. Very tragic. Yeah, it's really disturbing, and my heart still goes out to these families. I mean, we have done many shows on missing family members, and, and it's just horrific to have to not, to not know where your loved one is. To not know if they're safe or they're dead or what's happened. You've also gotten involved in a lot, and so did I, with the 9-11 uh, victims. I know um, with those family members, uh, some of them did not have never found remains, and some of them found remains over the years. They're probably still identifying some through DNA. Very tough. It is. And, you know, the interesting part about it is when I think about back on 9-11 and those early days is there are, you can live for many, many days without, without any food. So, you know, every day that passes is another stressor for these families. And I remember after 9-11, a lot of families felt like maybe our loved ones were trapped in air pockets. Maybe they had amnesia. Maybe they were trapped in a subway pocket somewhere underneath the Trade Center. And that went on for a couple of weeks, actually. Well, one of the things about uh, the 9-11 and, and about, and, and I remember some family members wanted to see remains later and some didn't, and years later, um, and it was quite a, a, an experience. But one of the things, Heidi, that struck me about this is that um, the uh, 370 crash is that those people, I think there were only a couple of Americans on there, and the people were Malaysian and Chinese, uh, the majority, and through the news media, we hear therapists talking, and you and I are therapists, talking about uh, delayed grief, uh, an article in the Huffington Post on ambiguous loss, uh, interviewing Pauline Voss, different things like that. But they're not talking about the Asian culture. They're talking about what it would be like for an American, for them, and the families that they deal with. So we're very honored today to have Jerry Cox on our show, and we're going to talk about uh, grief and culture so, um, Heidi, do you want to introduce Jerry? I'd love to. Our guest today, like you said, is Dr. Jerry Cox. Uh, Dr. Jerry Cox is a professor emeritus of sociology at University of Wisconsin La Crosse. He served as the director of the Center for Death Education and Bioethics. He has over 100 publications, including 17 books. He has served as editor of Illness, Crisis, and Loss, and for the Midwest Sociologist. He is a member of the International Work Group on Dying, Death, and Bereavement, and he has served on the board of directors of the National Prison Hospice Association. He has done so much with his life, and we are so glad to have him here today. Welcome to the show, Jerry. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be with you. It's great to have you on. Now, I know at one time you wrote a book uh, on culture and the American Indian and death, and I wondered uh, what your thoughts were about culture, and particularly given the Malaysian airplane crash, about uh, how the Asian culture may deal with grief a little differently than we do. I think uh, that all cultures deal with grief differently than the others. The, the one thing that we have to remember is to be culturally sensitive as hospice workers, caregivers, whoever we are. And unfortunately, many of us only use our own lens or narrow focused in how we treat other people. Uh, for example, uh, with, with um, Malaysian people, um, the, the uh, daughter, the oldest daughter, is often expected to, to take care of things for the family when there is a crisis and to support her parents so that they're free to do their grieving, which many times means she doesn't get to grieve as well. And also the, the idea is that, uh, that she may not even get married in order to take care of them as they age and uh, have other issues. But, of course, China, with their one-child policy, a lot of the traditions have changed over time. It's interesting, thinking about these families uh, of this airplane crash all being together, um, it w it might be an interesting mix because maybe the oldest daughter or maybe they don't have a daughter or maybe their their children are not there or, you know, uh, uh, people have, you know, have to be away from home for weeks at a time and who can actually do it and that kind of thing. So it's got to be confusing. Oh, extremely. Well, you were involved with 9-11. The fact that you don't know makes it even worse. And the fact that they're not telling you anything or what they're telling you is so ambiguous that you don't know anything 
not knowing is probably the hardest thing of, of, for many people in, in traumatic grief. When you don't have anything left of the person, it's, it's extremely difficult to work through your grief. And they announced this morning that the flight ended in the Indian Ocean, but that still doesn't give them any resolution because they don't know if they're on light boats or where they might be. Right. All they know is they said that it landed in the water. People there at, at the airport or wherever they're staying uh, waiting for news have to rely on each other. Their families, are, for the most part, aren't there. And so they have to hope that the people around them are strong and can give them strength rather than being distressed and making it worse. And, and I was thinking about, you're talking about the one, uh, you know, the, the daughter in some of the families, particularly the Malaysian families, um, uh, as I said, may not be there. They may be working. Yes, and the Malaysian people that I know well, uh, the, the daughters typically do work, and, and, and thus they have enough money they can stay home and take care of their mother after their father dies or whatever. So they're a little bit different than the Chinese culture also. Well, and then Taiwan and so forth even be different than China, and China itself, just like the United States, has different cultures depending on what part of China you're in. How do you think that people right now, the, the, cult, the Malaysian culture, the, you know, the family members that are waiting... How do you think that they are handling this different than compared to maybe somebody from the United States? Well, the cultural difference probably would be, although I think it's breaking down now, that they would accept what the government told them more easily than we would. We're a more rebellious society, and we tend to not trust our government and to not believe them. But I think they're beginning to reach the point where they don't believe them very well either now. Funerals I've been to in China, they tend to be a lot more... Um, loud at the funeral, but not so loud before, where we tend to cry before and then be more quiet at the funeral. Just a minor cultural difference, but I've noticed that too. Oh, that's and they're more likely to be quiet now, but then later they're going to make a lot of noise against the government, the airlines, and the prime minister, and whoever. Now, now I want to, getting back to the Chinese culture for a minute, um, don't they uh, cremate in China? Yeah, and they, they do this thing with paper. Um, I, the last year I went to in China, they burnt uh, like a Ferrari that was made out of paper so that he could have the Ferrari in, in heaven. Many of them are Buddhist, uh, you know, and other religions, but um, they burn money, even though it's not real money. They buy it at stores, they take money, so they'll have money. And they, Their funerals are, are very interesting and a lot of fun in a lot of ways, and, and they do it in a positive way. Um, there's less of the um, emotion in the negative sense, more of a positive emotion. Now, um, I like that. So it's more of a celebration of life, it sounds like. Yes, more like the Irish wake and so forth. Mm -hmm. They celebrate their life, and, and that's kind of it, and you don't go you know, on a regular visit. Now, I would guess the Malaysians are very, very different. What, what they would do, though, is typically make a shrine in the home. Oh, yes. Uh, pictures, trophies, whatever. Rather than go to the cemetery, they would honor them at home. I think that's the difference. Well, the other thing that I was a bit fascinated with, about is the uh, financial money uh, the airlines are giving people. And I was thinking, my goodness, they're giving them $20,000 right now, I believe was the sum. And I was thinking some of these people probably don't have much money at all, and they're giving them this money. And so they're able to leave their family and stay in this hotel for weeks together with no support. I mean, that's really got to be strange and a stressor. And probably a lot of them have never stayed in a hotel, or some of them have not, you know? So being oh, sure. away from your support system has got to be really something. Yes, but again, I think in this case, they're all there together, and they're probably supporting each other. Just like after 9-11, people gathered together and helped each other. But when we have traumatic death, it's like our whole world has changed, and it'll never be the same, and of course it won't be. And... It's a shock to our system. We get numb. I'm sure many of these people haven't even begun to grieve yet because they, they are still trying to figure out what's going on. They're also, they're also holding on to the hope that That's maybe right. their loved one was one of the ones that is going to survive this, even if, even if they crashed. I mean, that they would still survive. Well, I was just going to say my friend in Vietnam died in 65, and this last year I went back to Arlington to where his grave is, and, you know, I cried as if it was yesterday because I hadn't really grieved for him because I kept hoping he was alive. Well, I think uh, just one of the things I want to mention is as human beings, no matter what culture or country we're in, I believe there's some biological issues about the shock of a loved one uh, not being with us or dying and be missing. 
I think we do have, and I think sometimes it gets underplayed a little bit, uh, those biological responses that come in where we have these adrenaline rushes and all these hormonal things going on. Absolutely. I would agree. Yeah. So, well, listen, thank you so much for being on the show today. You've been listening to Open to Hope Radio, hosted by Drs. Gloria and Heidi Horsley. Like today's edition, all of our past programs are available on demand at opentohope.com, along with helpful articles, videos, resources, and links to help get you through the toughest time of your life. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter and sign up for our monthly newsletter. Again, that's opentohope.com. Check it out today. Then be sure to stop by next Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time when we'll be posting another edition of Open to Hope Radio. Remember, others have been where you are. They made it through, and you can too, as long as you're open to hope.